all set. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the uh, uh, Walter Fredrickson Endowed Seminar Series. Uh, let me start by telling you about Walter Fredrickson. Walter Fredrickson is a UF alum. He earned his BS in electrical engineering with honors in 1957. During his ne nearly 40 year career with Harris Corporation, Mr. Fredrickson worked on numerous projects, including complex computer based data processing, display, and communication systems for military and space applications. He also developed a new line of text editing and ad layout products for the newspaper industry that was the precursor of modern word processing and publication products and software. He was a member of the advisory boards for the, by both the CSE and the ECE departments, and he earned the College of Engineering's Distinguished Service Award in 1985. Walter is one of the smartest people that I know. Um, Walter's children are also, um, uh, Walter's children created this endowed seminar series to honor their father. Uh, my own kids are watching this seminar now and hopefully taking note. Um, Walter, his wife, Dory, and some of his children are in attendance. Uh, this year's speaker is Suzanne Keohane. Um, first time in this series, we've been running this series for four or five years now. First time in the series, we have an alum speak in it. Uh, Suzanne got her BS in computer engineering, actually in, uh, in 1998, just as we were starting the computer engineering program. And back at that time, it, that was when the new engineering building was really the new engineering building. <laughs> um, Suzanne then got an MS in software engineering from the University of Texas, and she's been at IBM for more than 20 years. I, I have to mention here this week, uh, IBM and UF announced a joint comprehensive skills program designed to extend UF's vision to be an international leader in AI, data science, FinTech, and other related technologies that can help uh, solve society's biggest challenges. As part of this program, an AI-focused master's program will be offered through UF's uh, 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 our new West Palm Beach satellite campus. That's a very exciting news happening all this, this week. Um, for IBM, Suzanne heads the Emerging AI Health Solutions and Innovation uh, for IBM Watson Health. She is an experienced pioneer of innovation with an aptitude for product development, growth strategies, and executing research initiatives like the IBM UCSD Center for Healthy Aging. Suzanne is an IBM master inventor with over 200 global patents issued. Uh, and she's in Florida this week to be inducted into the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame. Um, I'm not gonna take any more time from, from Suzanne. Uh, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. And I welcome Suzanne, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen. So give me one second. Make sure this shares. Are we all good? Can you see? Perfect. Yep, perfect. Yes. Perfect. So I appreciate you all joining. I'm going to talk about living to be 100 emerging technologies for healthy aging. Supporting older adults, you know, represents one of the most complex societal and economic challenges, you know, due to the increase of health care costs and the decrease of caregivers. We're seeing a lot of informal caregivers. Um, so these aren't, you know, this is family members kind of chipping in and it, it does have this economic um, kind of challenge to that. So for the next, Hour. I'm going to talk about my background of why I'm passionate about this topic. I'm um, explore some future technologies that help bridge the digital divide and improve the quality of life of the aging population. I'm going to talk about some previous research I did with artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things to support that personalized care delivery and management. And I'm also going to talk about some recent research that I'm working on to understand the lived experience of older adults using technology in the pandemic. Um, so let me start with a little bit about myself. Let me progress this slide. 
I attended the University of Florida, as per um, Dr. Harris said. Um, I also attended the University of Texas and got um, a master's in software engineering. I'm currently a PhD student um, at Lancaster University in the UK, and I'm pursuing a doctorate um, degree in health research for aging. So in the upper left picture is my grandmother, my siblings, and me. And if you can guess, I'm the one in the center. I have the fringe on. I was destined to be a Texan. And I want to tell you a little bit about my grandmother. Um, you know, she's really the inspiration for a lot of this research. She suffered an aneurysm when she was in her 80s, and she had to learn to walk and talk again. So I was just a little girl when this was happening. And even though she looked frail, I remember watching her do her workout. She would sit on the couch with her weights. And I was just so inspired by her sheer determination to regain her abilities. She had grit, she was resilient, she was optimistic, and she had a real strong desire to be independent. She really is the inspiration for my research um, into how older adults can live their healthiest lives for as long as possible. So in the center photo is a picture of me at a United States Patent Trade Office event. And I share this because I often partner with the United States Patent Trade Office as an invited speaker on the invention process and encouraging more women to invent. I'm a leading advocate for increased participation of women in STEM and an example of what's possible for female inventors. I have over 200 worldwide patents issued. And as uh, Dr. Harris said, I'll be inducted to the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame tomorrow. So my portfolio is around my passion. Uh, you know, I'm getting inducted for the technology I've developed to help people with disabilities, blind, deaf, hard of hearing, mobility, and also that translation of those technologies to help older adults, because as we age, our abilities change over time. I also wanna share with you a little bit more about myself and that's my career at IBM. I've been with IBM for over 20 years. And that last photo in the upper right is me working with a pepper robot. So for over a dozen years, I worked in IBM research. Um, two years ago, I decided to move out of research and move into one of our business units. I felt with my research background, with my engineering background, I could really help commercialize the amazing technology that was being developed in research. So I lead the enablement of acceleration of the health innovations where I can develop the strategic partnerships, um, product roadmaps, and kind of execute the multi-year business plans. So it's a, it's a new kind of avenue for me, and I'm, I'm really excited, but I still <laughs> And I'll share some of that as part of my PhD program. So now that you know a little bit about me, let me kind of talk about the topic at hand. Aging is happening. We are all aging every day, and that's a good thing. Um, people are living longer. The older adult population is rising at historic rates. The global demographic shift is disrupting key industries like healthcare, insurance, and it will have a profound implication for the kind of offerings we create, how we go to market, and how we engage and tap into this older customer. So when you think of an older population, you often think of countries like Japan or Italy, and they're really leading the charge. Um, in Japan, one in every four people in their population is over 65. That's 25% of their population. But what I think is really interesting about this demographic trend is even countries that you might consider a younger population like India and Brazil, they are living longer too. So if you look at the statistics between 2010 and 2050, that's 40 years, the prediction is that these younger population countries, older adults will increase by more than 250%. So the world is aging. We're no longer what they used to call a pyramid. We're starting to look more like a skyscraper. And each segment is, is equally represented. So what does this mean? So, you know, as we advance technology with new phones, new smart applications, new social media, 
sometimes the older adult gets left behind. For example, an older adult who might be losing their ability to drive um, is a major life transition. Better access to transportation would help improve their independence. But if you think of emerging technologies like rideshare applications or autonomous vehicle, you don't often think of targeting that to an older adult. People are starting to do that. And you know, Local Motors has Ollie, which is an autonomous vehicle to help people with disabilities and older adults move around. It's easy to get into, and there's a lot of other features. So it's starting to happen, but it's really not at the forefront. Mainly technology often is geared to the young or new technology, or emerging technology. So there's a great quote by Laura Carstensen that challenges converting a world built for and by the young into a world that supports and engages a population that lives a hundred years and beyond. And I mean a hundred and beyond. And I really mean a hundred and beyond. <laughs> we are dawning on the age of the super centenarian. And I find this to be most interesting. If you were to look up the hundred oldest people living today, you would have to be 110 to be on that list. You're not even on the list if you're 109. You have to be 110 or older to be on that list. Think about that. Even two more decades of life on this earth will give you 10 million more minutes and over 7,000 more opportunities to watch the sunrise and sunset. So how can we make the most, most of those later years for our older population? So the technology is happening. So now I'm gonna like talk about some of the work that I've done in IBM research, and then I'll talk about some of the future work. Space was to see if we can use ambient sensors to enable accurate detection of behavioral patterns. So detecting humans in their wild, and the wild is their home. An identification of the routines that they're doing, the classifications of behaviors, is it normal, is it abnormal? So every room in the home tells a unique story about an older adult's daily lives. The research question we were asking is, can we monitor these changes over time to look for anomalies and patterns for when they sleep, eat, cook, bathe, mobility, and have visitors? These are like the activities of daily living. In 2016, we ran a one-person pilot um, research project. And through observation, we can understand normal behaviors and routines of a given individual. And the power of observation comes from these ambient sensors that we placed in the environment. We aggregate all of the data, the sensor regions in the home, and that's that big knowledge graph in the middle. In three months, 48 sensors, you have over 500 million graph of elements and that from 290,000 sensor readings. That is big data. Um, and so what we were able to see, and I'm going to show you this visualization, is the daily patterns. So what you're seeing on the right-hand side is a visualization of three months of data. And when it starts off, it's very faded. I'll play it again for you. Because we have the data is just starting, right? And each kind of around the circle is the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then around that is the hours of the day. So what you're looking at is Monday through Friday, or my, sorry, Monday through Sunday, and each hour of the day. And when the colors start off faint, that's because we're just collecting the data. And if they fired on the same day at the same time, it got, gets a little darker. So what you're seeing is these daily patterns of this person's routine. They're firing the same sensors at the same time on the same day at the same hour. And that really shows you how much creatures of habit we are. We do develop these patterns and that's the patterns that we're looking for to really kind of draw correlations of 
better health outcomes. If all of a sudden these shifted and the patterns weren't happening in the morning and you start a lot of late night activity, that might be cause. So these are the type of things that we're looking for when we're doing this ambient sensor um, data collection. So in 2018, we took that to five more um, independent living apartments at an aged care facility. We were looking at technology that could generate the new insights that reduce risk, reduce the cost of care, and significantly improve the quality of life of older adults. For this project, we deployed high density of sensors, but ultimately we were looking for the minimal number of sensors needed to feed our algorithms and derive the highest value from this data. So on the left-hand side, what you're seeing is a quick replay, a data loop, um, a visualization, a, a spatial temporal visualization of data playing back on a floor plan at 100 times the speed. So the left snapshot is between midnight and 4 a.m. So between midnight and 4 a.m., you would expect sensors to be quiet. Well, we're detecting a lot of activity. And so the question is this high frequency activity something to be concerned about? If you look at when the, where the activity is happening, it's from the bedroom to the bathroom to the bedroom to the bathroom. There's this pattern of back and forth. So for an alert system, this is probably a sensor readings that you would want to notify someone to maybe check in on the older adult the next day to make sure everything is okay. This type of pattern could be a cause for alarm. If we look at the middle visualization, this is where things get a little bit more challenging. Um, entity disambiguation is really hard. So this is one hour of a playback of a person's apartment who lives alone. But as you kind of look at the data on this center graph, and I'm gonna kind of move ahead a bit, you start to see that both of the bathrooms are occupied. So there's obviously someone else in this house. So how do you begin to How do you begin to um, understand who you're monitoring? So as someone else comes into this environment, you don't want their signals to influence the data that you've collected on the primary resident. So this can be really difficult. And it also begs the question, how do you track the ADLs of couples? Um, and there's many different ways to attack this problem, but these are some of the you know, questions that always surface when you do some big research um, projects. So the visualization on the right, I thought was really interesting. Um, this was one person's um, apartment who lived alone. They don't allow pets. And so when we were analyzing the data, we just thought that there might've been some sensor misfire so really unusual patterns. It seemed like there was someone always by the sliding glass window. Well, in an interview with the residents, it turns out that they would have their daughter's dog come visit. So that unusual pattern that we thought was the individual or potentially sensor misfire was actually the pet. So you kind of need that context sometimes to really understand what's going on. And this is kind of the challenge of when you're doing these really like high density deployments and using the ambient sensors to kind of track those human behaviors. So the complex future systems are going to have to be personalized. You're going to, I, we're going to have to come into the home because I feel like that's when you really understand how someone is living and how they live will impact their health. But there's a lot of challenges to solve when we try to go into these spaces. So this was some of the research that we were doing on you know, sensor deployment, big data, um, using AI on these big data sets to, to kind of drive better health outcomes. So when we think back and we step back, there's a lot of questions when you try to harness the power of big data. You know, we can collect all the data from IoT, wearable sensors, social interactions, health records, and build a holistic model 
um, we construct and maintain it and monitor it. Um, so if you think of the process, you're going from this raw data ingestion to identifying activities of daily living, um, from activities of daily living all the way up to taking the appropriate actions. Each one of these layers are quite complex and have a lot of research behind them and a lot of future research that's needed. Ideally, you definitely need all of this data to be safe, secure, and protect it. And to really get the holistic view, you almost have to start to break down the silos, you know, where all the data lives, kind of pull it together in order to have this meaningful and actionable and simple insights. So that's how we can build solutions that will drive the insights with context of the individual's life with the goal of improving outcomes and lowering costs. The biggest challenge though is, can we do this at scale for all older adults in a city, a country, a continent? And, and that's some of the other challenges that you know, we're working on in research. So now I'm gonna talk about the pandemic and it's happening and it's still happening, unfortunately. <laughs> um, older adults were adversely affected by the pandemic. Compared to 18 and 29 year olds, someone who is 50 to 64 is four times likelier to be hospitalized. And as you increase in age, the factor of the probability of hospitalization goes up. So someone who is 85 is 13 times likely to go be hospitalized if they contact COVID. And unfortunately, eight out of 10 deaths reported in the US have been people over 65 years old. So the pandemic has caused governments to enact mandatory public health restrictions. This is including sheltering in place, stay at home mandates, lockdowns, curfews, quarantines, mask wearing, social distance guidelines, public space closures, travel restrictions, public transportation shutdown in some countries. So at many older adults who are living in communities, the community centers were closed, exercise facilities were closed, restaurants were closed, game rooms were closed. A lot of the social activity was halted. Older adults were often told to self-isolate, to stay safe. Yet the barriers and facilitators of older adults' use of technology during this world-changing event are, for the most part, unknown. So the current research I'm doing, um, and I have uh, my professor, my supervisors for my PhD are part of a paper that we just wrote, um, Caroline Swarzbach at Lancaster University and Dr. Hila, um, he teaches here at UF. We worked on a paper following the guidance of Thomas and Hardin thematic synthesis method for qualitative research and Braun and Clark's thematic analysis using iterative inductive reasoning. The purpose of this paper was to synthesize the literature on broader health and social impacts on older adults from lockdown related measures caused by the pandemic and to learn from their lived experience. So this is a qualitative assessment of qualitative research to really capture that voice of the older adults and you know, how they use technology during the pandemic and how the in pandemic impacted them. So the search strategy consisted of three concepts. We looked at all the literature that had COVID, pandemic, all the terms associated with that, older adults and technology. And the technology looked at all sorts of technologies to really pull any type of paper that was done in the last year on this topic. The search strategy was run against title and abstracts of peer reviewed studies, six databases, um, and that resulted in 9,498 articles. From there, we looked at inclusion criteria, um, such as the paper in English, peer reviewed, had to target adults over 60, 
um, and present results from analysis of primary outcomes, not secondary. This included studies on the phenomena of interests using a qualitative method to capture the live experience and views of independent older adults on the use of technology during the pandemic. The exclusion criteria for um, our literature review was older adults with cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's dementia, who lived at a long-term nursing facility and who did not personally interact with the technology. The title and abstract screening resulted in 39 papers. After doing a full text eligibility screening, we were down to 12 papers. In the end, or sorry, 24 papers. In the end, the 24 papers um, that were reviewed spanned 13 countries across six continents and had 200 or 2,317 older adults who had participated in an open-ended survey, semi-structured interview, um, something like that qualitative method during the pandemic. The literature depicted the impact of COVID on older adults. Some of the impact was it forced a change in their daily routine. They were often secluded and confined to their home. They came, became more um, sedentary and isolated. And this obviously leads to harming mental and physical health and overall well being when you're isolated. Older adults saw technology as a tool to cope with this restrictive social conditions. And, and this is kind of key. You, the forcing function of the pandemic enabled them or forced them to kind of learn technologies in order to stay connected. And you, you don't unlearn what you learn. So what was interesting is the pandemic use of technology was really to support meaningful goals. So as everyone in society turned to technology to stay connected, there was challenges faced by these older adults and mainly because of the digital divide. Older adults are impacted by the digital divide regardless of their community type, whether they're urban, suburban, rural. However, the rural population, especially in countries like Nigeria, um, were heavily affected by the limited access to reliable electricity and internet connection. What's even more interesting, because of the pandemic, you have the digital divide, but you also have the pandemic, which caused this double exclusion. So the digital divide, along with the limited contact with social networks, really restricted and caused a lot of restrictions for these older adults. So what is interesting is the themes that came out of um, this literature review, there was three you know, primary themes. And the first theme is really centered on personal belief and perceptions of oneself. On one end of the spectrum, you can find that older adults cited strong uh, perseverance to keep up with the time, they overcame their fear of technology, and they really strived for independence. On the other end of the spectrum, you saw a lot of older adults who had kind of internalized ageism, this perceived a diminished future lifespan. They only have so much time to live. Do they really want to learn this technology? They view technology as only for the young. They didn't see themselves using the technology. And they had an overall lack of confidence in adopting technology into their lives. So on the bottom, you can see some of the quotes that reflected this. Um, on the, the very um, positive side, I love this one. I'm still living in this world. Things are going to change. I mean, things are changing so fast that you have to keep up or you'll get left behind. That's someone who is really, really resilient. And they're looking at technology as the means to the end to keep them connected. And, you know, on the other end, you kind of see folks that are a little bit lacking of confidence. Their concern is that they're inability to use phones like everyone else. It's not their comfort zone. If they were younger, then they would probably use it. You know, this is that diminished future time. And, and, and I really do think this uh, media's view of age and ageism in our media has to kind of feed into this. The second theme um, explores the digital literacy continuum. 
So the American Library Association defines digital literacy as the ability to use information and communication technologies to find, evaluate, create, and communicate information requiring both cognitive and technical skills. Digital literacy continuum plots the progression of someone with no digital skills to someone who has mastered the competency with technology. Whereas some older adults begin the pandemic as digital literates, they were exposed to technology. Others started the um, pandemic as a digital illiterate. They, they really had no knowledge of how to use technology. What was interesting is irrelevant to where they started, across the board, the primary factor driving the decisions to improve their technology skills depended on the purpose of use. So some older adults came into the pandemic with competencies due to prior workplace exposure to technology. Um, Purpose-driven need motivated the move along that continuum to kind of reach a certain digital competency. Older adults require specific and straightforward training to help with that transition to become more digitally literate and independent technology users. There's a great emphasis on real-time learning to acquire knowledge to meet an immediate need. The evolution of technology and new technology is always ever expanding this digital literacy continuum. So even if you're perfecting, as we all know, a certain technology, there's always the next one down the road that you'll have to learn. And what you know, the, the analysis showed is that the emotional meaningful goals were the greatest motivator for older adults to gain the necessary knowledge to kind of move along the continuum. So as you can see, as some of the quotes, someone who had prior experience, they probably used computers in the business when in the 80s. Um, others were driven by a purpose. You know, they wanted to talk with their grandchildren. They were not going to miss their grandchildren growing up and technology was the way for them to do that. So they had to learn how to use Zoom in order to stay connected. And then the real-time training was interesting. You know, one of the quotes was training needs to be right then because if I do it way ahead of time, I will forget. So the idea of having continual um, feedback and, and understanding how to use it was something that surfaced in the analysis. Um, and then, you know, it starts to become a new normal. So as people gain these skills, this is one of the quotes, I am communicating more than ever. I have new friends. I guess I want to say I'm better with technology. So that's someone that's really starting to adapt it and see the benefits. So the last theme that kind of surfaced from this literature was the barriers and facilitators. And, and these to me seem pretty obvious. Um, barriers to technology include physical limitations, limited infrastructure, and financial costs. Older adults who are often what we call in digital poverty, um, you know, that's measured by one's ability to afford and access technology, those were often more challenged to, to be able to jump on this digital literacy continuum. Um, what where facilitators were definitely family and the technical support and supporting peers. These were the things that helped older adults kind of overcome the hurdle and start to master the technology they needed to fulfill the purpose in their life. So what's fascinating is the older adult population is definitely not homogeneous. It's a heterogeneous pop population and, and they can't be treated one is the same for all. We each will age uniquely based on our genetics, on our environment and personal attitude towards life. Any type of solution you build cannot be a one size fit all. So out of this paper and understanding the literature over the last year, looking at technology use of older adults during the pandemic, what really surfaced is the rewards can be life-changing for those who persevere with technology. They stayed connected with family and friends during the social isolation. They utilized digital services to complete tasks like acquiring groceries, and they increased their independence. So, 
this type of technology use and in helping build technology for older adults really kind of showed its importance because of what has happened over the last year. So that's what I had to present to you today, looking at a little bit of who I am and the research I um, have done and the research I'm doing. So Professor or Dr. Harris, should we open it up for questions? Yes, thank you, uh, Suzanne. That was uh, wonderful. Uh, people can ask questions in the Q&A link. Uh, first question we have is from Michael Fang who is asking what kind of sensors are you deploying and how reliable is the data and what attributes are you doing? So kind of in general on these different projects. Yeah, so, so the two research projects I showed you, I, and I guess I didn't say this, we wanted to use consumer grade sensors. We didn't want to use anything um, too far advanced than what you could purchase, you know, almost in a hardware store. Um, so we were looking at, you know, those sensors are surprisingly um, can can give you a lot of information. Most of the attributes were just when they fired. So we were looking at um, detecting motion through uh, motion detection. So the firing is either the, it detects a person or it doesn't. Um, so that was a lot of it. Um, we did have some bed sensors. So with a bed sensor and, and depending on what kind of bed sensor it is, you can ascertain a lot of information. You can um, pull in some, some vitals like heart rate, heart rate variability, sleep quality. But I think the one thing that was um, most beneficial was, is the person in bed or not in bed? Just knowing where someone is and how long they stay in bed is, is quite um, important. You can imagine if someone's starting to, um, become sick or you know not feeling well they're going to spend more time in bed and you're going to see the overall activity in the apartment go down as their time in bed increase so that that was some of the um sensors and sensor data that we were using um but again we were looking at the consumer consumer grade sensors there's a lot cooler sensors on the market and in, in research um but we didn't use those for those projects Okay, and then a follow-up question from Dr. Fang is how, kind of in general, how do you analyze the sensed data? What you use machine learning? Or what, what are your- Yeah, so you have to, to, to pull it all in and there's different machine learning models that um, worked really well um, to, to analyze the data. And we, we definitely had to use those type of models because it is so, so much data. So you're really looking for those um, patterns. And we did do some, initially some rule-based, so not even machine learning, but just rule-based processing um, to start off with. And then we kind of took that and then started to do classifications using machine learning. Okay, uh, lots of questions coming in. So here's an interesting one. What was the most shocking discovery on the abnormal behaviors after analyzing the data? Um, you know, what was, I thought was interesting. If I looked at the different individuals, um, even though how you looked at their data could be very differently, ultimately you could, could discern information. Let, let, let me clarify. So there was you know, one individual who was definitely on a pattern. They got up at the same time every day. They, um, you know, did their showering, toileting routine, same time every day. They were out the door at the same time every day. It, it was like clockwork. Um, I always wondered where were they going to at a certain time? Cause they were just like a perfect routine and you could see the pattern. So if this person all of a sudden this pattern was disrupted, you know, after a month or two of data, you, you, you would say, okay, what's going on? But there were other individuals that you you couldn't really pick up a daily pattern, you know, with their daily at, um, you know activities of daily living. You know, they showered at different times. Like it was a little more sporadic when you were trying to find, um, you know, these these you know activities. But what was interesting, if you stood stood back and looked at the overall 
sensor um, data, you did see a general activity level. And this one um, individual, the activity went down and then all of a sudden time in bed went up. So you could see that something happened where couldn't, like I said, pick out the different activities of daily living, but you could see a change in behavior. So I thought that was the most interesting thing. It Again, everyone is a little bit different, but there's still a pattern there that, that can, can be found and then could help the individual. You could, you know, if she's or he's in bed longer, that's, you would want to check in and say, you know, what's going on here. Okay, thank you. There's uh, another question is, um, is there a solution to the siloed uh, issue, Alexa versus Google versus Apple uh, sensor hub deployment that we see in industry today? Uh, we don't want to get stuck to one vendor family, right? Getting everything to talk to one another. Yeah, I, I don't have an answer for that. I could tell you what I want. I, I want my data, my life. Like I want my data. It's my data and I want to be able to move it to whatever company that I feel could serve me best. Um, that's not how it's designed today. Um, and I, I, I have no predictions of how to break those silos, but I definitely agree with you. It, 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 is, it is challenging and I think it's challenging for researchers. I think it's challenging for consumers. And um, yeah, I wish, I wish there was that portability. Yeah, I, I know you visited the Nelms Institute with Dr. Bunia and that, and that is a big concern for all of IoT, right? How to get everything to talk. Um, he, he Ting Wang asks a, a question on all of our minds um, about the potential privacy concerns yes. when you deploy sensors in people's homes and monitor their daily routines. How do the participants feel about, about that? Yeah, so obviously we went through an RV and you know there are consenting adults um, that joined our study. I think that goes back to the second part of my discussion on the qualitative side. I think understanding the roots of concern and addressing them is important. And as you know, we have devices all around us monitoring us, our internet usage, our cell phone usage, our GPS. I mean, we all have this data being collected on us. So I, I think privacy and security is of the utmost importance. And, um, and so for our studies, you know, we designed them with that in mind, um, but going forward on a commercialized product, I, I, I do think those kind of concerns need to be addressed. Yeah, it's a, certainly an open, open problem, right? With many yeah, others. yeah. Um, uh, here's a, a talk from, uh, a question from Aftab Bavadia. Um, Although this talk focused on technology, are there other factors that can impact the health of aging adults? For example, loneliness, social stress, financial, um, some of which can be institutionally engraved uh, based on culture, countries. For example, in Eastern countries, common for adults to live with their children. Um, while in Western countries, we, we don't do this. Um, and so kind of non-technology things at play. Yeah, um, there was a study several years ago, um, uh, and it was in England, and I think it was the, um, I think it was the government of England. I think they had a Ministry of Loneliness, because what the study found was loneliness does impact health. Um, it was some kind of equivalent of loneliness is equivalent to smoking fifteen cigarettes a day. I, I, you know, pulling from my memory of what the study was, but. I agree. I think social connection um, is is really key, and I, that really surfaced in the pandemic. Uh, the isolation had tremendous impact on older adults, um, and that lack of having access to the technology and understanding how to use tech technology caused that double exclusion. Um, and it, and it, it's something that we need to be aware of and address. And we we do need um, kind of, uh, you know, the digital equity of this kind of technology, and especially focusing on older adults. So hopefully uh, more governments will, you know, put that into practice um, because the cost is there. And, and as you get older, 
uh, many older adults have um, a set budget. So they don't have the extra funds for this kind of technology. And if they're just trying to learn it to stay connected, this, this can be a big problem. So I think there's a lot of things that are outside of technology that influence the well being of older adults. And, you know, just someone's attitude towards life has one of the biggest impacts to, to their longevity. They have, are more optimistic. If they have a perseverance and a resilience, you tend to live longer. So, so I, I do think um, technology is just a tool. Ultimately, um, there's a lot of other factors for sure. Okay. Um, another question from Dr. Fang. Different people have different initial conditions and economic constraints. So how can we draw any conclusions on longevity? Um, and he, he read a news article that's recruiting a thousand people in New York to monitor their lives for study for their entire life. And he's wondering if you're familiar with that, if there's any update on that study. Oh, I'm, I'm not familiar with it. And I do think people's um, preconditions are important. Um, you know, the, the studies we were doing were looking for the right type of intervention at the right time. So it, it wasn't, it was to ensure that um, if someone was living independently and they were at a point of transition, meaning that they're, they're doing okay, but they might not be tomorrow. And, and I think those points of transition are really challenging because if you add a higher level of care, it's really costly. But if you don't, then there's a possibility of something catastrophic can happen. So, you know, as people transitioning into the higher care need, it's not always, it's not always black and white. So it's a little bit fuzzy. So the idea is, could, you know, we use some sensors to help with that, um, that transition and to ensure that, you know, they got the right care at the right time. And, and that was the goal of that. Okay. The, the, um, and it's not just about longevity, I guess, right? It's kind of quality of, of life while you're alive. Yeah, sure. exactly. Live your healthiest life longerest, you know? Um, and, you know, the quality of life is interesting because if you survey and a lot of surveys of older adults, they want to stay independent. Um, they want to live independently. They don't want to move out of their home. So for them, taking them out of the environment that they know so well, away from the neighbors they know so well, out of the community they know so well, um, could potentially disrupt their quality of life. So the idea is like, if it, how can we help someone age in place if that's where they want to be? And how can we help them do that safely? Okay. Uh, Gabriel Aurelis asks um, that about again about privacy and security, and of course they're very important. However, he is willing to sacrifice that, that privacy for additional security, better sensors, better identification of issues. Could this be something that each person could opt in or opt out and say, "I, I don't care about privacy. I'm all in." Sign me up for yeah. all this. Yeah, so I definitely, that goes back to the commercialization and the consumer and, and um, choosing to be, you know, a part, uh, giving their data and being monitored. Um, it can go both ways. I, I've seen, you know, in, in some of my work that people are very concerned about, about privacy and they, you know, should be. And is my data safe? How will it be used? And I think those questions need to be addressed. I also have seen, you know, folks who kind of trust the systems and, and, and their, their main goal is to be safe. So do whatever you need to do, keep me safe. If I fall, I want someone to come quickly, not two hours from now. So, so that's almost more important than the privacy aspect because in their view was, you know, I need to be safe and that's my highest. So I think everyone, has a right to have a different hierarchy to, to what's important to them. And you'll, you'll see the spectrum for sure. Okay. The, um, there's another issue. If, for example, the internet goes down and you were relying on these, yeah. these, these yeah. things, or if uh, cybersecurity, somebody's hacking in and 
and yeah. playing games with you as you're relying on these sensors. So there's always bad actors, right? You know, yeah. I, I think the technology itself is neither bad nor good. It's how, what people are doing with it, right? So you have these bad actors um, and I, I don't have an answer for that. That's just cruel. Uh, but with regards to the internet, you know, a lot of um, the technology, um, a lot of it like in this space um, uses cellular for that reason. So they find cellular to be um, a little more reliable um, than the internet. And what we also found is you have to worry about um, the frequencies and if there's any other kind of system in place, especially at aged care facilities, um, if they do distribute, um, you know, kind of the necklaces that you press panic button type things, if they're on a certain frequency, you definitely don't want to be operating any type of high tensor deployment on that frequency. So there was a lot of things that we had to take into consideration, um, but cellular is definitely one avenue that would help with the reliability. I see. Um, Caleb Boyer is asking about when you do the study, do the participants have to sign a liability waiver and what the risks that they assume and any, is there, are there any risks unique to the study? Yeah, so we didn't, we collected the data, we didn't do real time intervention. So they, they opted into the study to have the data collected and then we analyzed the data later. So we didn't set up a system or a study that would have that kind of liability, meaning that if, if we detected someone and someone didn't act on it, that you know that would cause a liability. That's not how we set up the study. So we, we process the data after the fact. I see. And, and you use the standard, I, whoever got the initial data ran standard IRB protocols yes. and informed, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, informed consent, what, all their, of that. what the risks are and all, all mm -hmm. those things. Yeah. And we also, um, we did with the folks participating, we we did a whole session with them where they could look at the sensors, they could ask questions. We did a whole like Q&A to get them comfortable, familiar and make sure they understood what they were agreeing to. Um, so we, we had those type of sessions also. Okay, I wanna ask my own question as we're nearing the end here. So you have um, over 200 global patents and like 137 or so US patents. So what can you tell the young people listening about patent and pat patenting and that whole process? You've certainly excelled at it. Did you, are you there, Suzanne? She seems to have frozen. Okay, so she has frozen. I think that might be the end of our seminar. Okay, thank you everybody for participating. And unfortunately, Suzanne uh, froze up at the end. Okay, we'll see everybody later. <laughs>